Dr. Saunders, my colleague here uh, at the University of Chicago, is uh, the living donor advocate at our transplant center here. She is a bioethicist uh, who teaches at the McLean Center. She does work and research on kidney failure uh, and disparities amongst minority patients related to organ, uh, organ failure, um, and is a, a, both a clinician, a practicing clinician, hospital, you moved hospitals to general now. You used to be a hospitalist, but now is a general practitioner. Um, uh, but we've been colleagues for uh, a long time, and she's involved with a project she'll tell you about if she has time uh, that we're working together to increase knowledge uh, around organ donation. So I'll just turn over the mic to you. Yeah? Thank you. All right, thank you. I know this has been a full morning. Um, so we have just a couple things to address um, during our time. Um, so I want to talk to you about um, understanding the need for living donation in the US, um, to understand the benefits of living donation, um, also to understand the risks, um, and then to understand the process of evaluation, selection, and recovery for living donors so that people can make um, an informed decision and to talk to people within your community about those decisions. So first we'll start off I can get closer. Um, with what do the kidneys do? So the kidneys do many things to help keep us healthy. The thing that we probably all know and think about is that they um, make urine to remove waste from our body, um, but they also make a hormone that helps to make our red blood cells. Um, they help to regulate blood pressure, uh, and they regulate minerals in our blood uh, and control how much water is in our body. And so these small organs do a lot of things, and when they are not functioning at the optimal level, we can have a variety of systems that are um, not operating as they should. And when we think about kidney disease in the US, um, it's the loss of kidney function, and it happens over months to years. Um, and it is about um, 48 million people in the US have kidney disease. That's about 15% of the population. And when we think about some other diseases that we worry about, like diabetes, which is also very important, there are actually more people in the US who have kidney disease than people who have diabetes. Um, it's also um, the most common cause is diabetes, but then also high blood pressure. There are other things that may be genetic or related to medications or other illnesses but those are the two most common things that we really worry about and want to control to prevent progression. And then end-stage renal disease, which is where someone would be needing renal replacement therapy, is the final stage of kidney disease. And it's a disease that's associated with high morbidity and reduced quality of life. Um, there, it's a small percent of the US, less than 1% of the US population has end-stage renal disease. But when we think about it, it's really expensive. And in terms of risk of illness and death, we think about its severity as on par with the co most common cancers. So relatively uncommon, but also relatively um, severe. Um, and we know that Muslim Americans are at a higher risk for kidney disease. I can't tell you the exact numbers because in the US we don't sort of measure Muslim American as a category and it really encompasses multiple races and ethnicities. And so, but I can say that um, Arab, Arab Americans are at a higher risk for high blood pressure, hypertension, um, one of the most common causes of kidney disease. Um, South Asian Americans are at a greater risk for diabetes and African Americans are at a greater risk for hypertension, diabetes, and even with those diseases are at a greater risk for progression to um, kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. And this is just one way to look at it. So we see that when we look at the relative prevalence, so how many people have sort of kidney disease at the milder forms, we see that it's relatively equal among the common racial ethnic groups that we measure, that were measured in this study, um, whites, uh, African Americans, and Hispanics. Um, but then when we look at the proportion who go on to develop end-stage renal disease, so the most severe form, we see that all racial and ethnic minority groups have a higher rate of going on to develop the most severe form um, compared to non-Hispanic whites. And when that happens, there, people require supplements so that they can continue to live, and we call that renal replacement therapy. So the three most common forms of renal replacement therapy, two are called dialysis, so many of you are familiar with this. Um, so hemodialysis, and that's where a machine um, takes blood out of your body, 
filters it, filters waste and excess fluid, and then returns the clean blood to your body. That needs to happen several times a week, so three times a week for a block of time throughout the day. And usually that happens at a dialysis facility. Um, as you can imagine, that's pretty disruptive. Um, the other form of dialysis is called peritoneal dialysis. That's where fluid um, enters the abdomen um, through an opening and through osmosis, the excess waste um, and fluid kind of comes out the other side. I don't know if we, if the point is working, but you can see in that other bag, and that happens, again, every day over multiple hours a day, um, and that's necessary also to sustain life. And then the third form, which is, as you will see, um, is both better in terms of maintaining high quality of life um, and also maintaining health is um, transplant. And that's where we take a kidney um, and put it someplace that, it, that is not naturally, but that kidney is able to take over the function of the kidneys that are no longer working as well, and they do all of those functions in terms of maintaining the blood pressure, making urine, filtering waste, um, and producing those hormones that the native kidneys would normally do. So why is organ donation important? So in the U.S., um, there are about 84,000 people um, waiting for a kidney transplant. Now, that's much smaller than the number of people who actually have end-stage renal disease. Um, so there are about 490, about 500,000 people who are on dialysis, so this good but less than optimal treatment for end-stage renal disease, and only a small portion of those actually appear on the transplant wait list. Um, and we know that of those people, the small select group that appear on the transplant wait list, there's still a long wait to receive um, a kidney transplant. In some regions, it's as long as five years. We say four to five years. Um, but it can be even longer depending on your blood type and the region of the U.S. that you reside in. Um, and so why living donation? So one benefit of living donation is that the transplants work better, they last longer, and people are able to get them faster um, compared to um, the deceased donor kidneys. It helps to reduce, reduce or eliminate time on, trans, on dialysis, um, which is associated with better survival um, and better quality of life. Um, and it reduces the weight because, as we said, there are a lot of individuals um, who need the kidneys, and the weight is about five years. Um, and we know that currently about half of transplanted kidneys in the U.S. are from living donors um, to help to um, increase the pool um, and to reduce uh, consequences of remaining on dialysis. So then this is who can be a living donor. So adults, tip, we want people to be over 18. Um, in some places it's 21, but adults. Um, and typically under 70, not because some 70-year-olds don't have lovely kidneys and are able to um, give a kidney, um, but we also know that we want people to not just be able to give a kidney that's healthy and working, but also to do well after the surgery themselves. And after 70, we, for most of us, um, just due to living and all of the things that happen, cardiovascularly, um, the recovery may be more difficult. And so typically, um, adults between 18 to 70. Um, and then people must be able to make an informed and voluntary decision. And what we mean by that is um, people uh, who want to donate must be able to understand both the benefits and the risks and be able, not with high scientific accuracy, but just be able to articulate, this is what could happen, um, and this is why I'm doing it, um, must be um, free, not receiving money or other material consideration, and, you know, they're very, as in different cultures, showing appreciation for this gift um, may vary, and so we want to make that clear because we've had discussions where people are doing something that is completely culturally appropriate by offering some, someone thanks for this gift that they're giving their family members, um, but we want to remove that, what we think of as an incentive, um, to, make, to allow that person to make a decision that is free without sort of thinking that they're gonna get this extra thing perhaps to benefit themselves or their family. We really want it to be a gift without, without strings or direct benefit. Um, and also we want people not to be pressured to agree. Um, and as many of us know, sort of families and communities 
are complicated. And so um, we want the best for the person who is ill um, and we can exert different pressures um, to encourage people to say yes or to consider something that they may not. And so certainly um, in complicated family systems, we don't interfere with that dynamic, but we do want a chance to know that the person ultimately is making a decision um, without feeling like they have a recourse. So we can encourage people, and, and that's what we do, um, to think about things, but ultimately the decision is the person who has to have the surgery and has to sort of live with the, with the consequences. And we want donors to be in both good physical and emotional health. So no healthcare provider wants to do anything that is going to cause harm to, um, to someone. Um, and so we want people to be without um, significant blood pressure. Depending on the center, um, that can be um, blood pressure that's well controlled on one medication. Um, some centers like ours, we say no blood pressure, no blood pressure medications. Um, without, uh, we want people to be free from illnesses that would cause them harm in the future. So no diabetes um, and no kidney disease. Um, and then we also want people to be free from illness or disease that would cause harm to the person that they're donating to. So no cancer um, and no infections that can sort of be spread as, as they um, share their organ with someone else. Um, we want people to be able to make the decision and be sort of emotionally ready to accept the consequences. So no um, untreated um, depression, anxiety, other mental illness, no substance abuse. And by untreated, I want to say that having depression or anxiety or um, some mental um, illness uh, is not, doesn't rule someone out, it just needs to be treated um, and, and the person needs to be under control. Um, and we talk to people's counselors, physicians, and therapists to ensure that, um, not as a judgment, but really to ensure um, their safety and their health. Um, and uh, we want the individual not to be um, obese. Um, overweight is fine in the U.S. as we know that weights creep up. Um, we don't want to set an impossible bar and we don't want to set a bar that we can't meet ourselves. And so we want um, the donors to have the ability to recover um, as well as possible and to be, have lower risks for future illness. Um, and so we say um, overweight. Uh, and, and I will say though, we work with people, so people who are not quite ready to donate um, because of some issues they haven't quite met with their uh, counselor, they may not know um, what their illnesses are, they haven't seen a doctor for a while, or they know that they need to lose weight, we welcome people to come in and sort of consider this, and then as they get things in order, um, we sort of work with them to be uh, a more optimized, to be a better candidate for donation. So sometimes it's a process. Um, and so when we think about costs, um, it requires a lot of visits to the medical center. Um, we try to streamline the process, as do a lot of medical centers, um, but we want to ensure that the person who donates um, is healthy and that they understand the process. And so they hear the same um, spiel about risks and benefits and have the same evaluation from multiple people, which we do on purpose so that um, people can hear that information. We welcome people's family members to come with them so that they can also hear, um, because sometimes when you're hearing stuff, you're thinking about the person you want to donate to um, and not necessarily thinking about yourself. Um, and so we welcome people to have um, their support people to also listen um, and, and ask questions um, on your behalf. Um, we know that um, the recovery can range based on what you need to do to get back to 100%. So we recommend that everyone take at least two weeks off. Um, and some people take as long as uh, three months off, depending on the type of work they do um, or the type of recreation. So, you know, our marathon runners and weightlifters um, have as long of a recovery time as some um, um, police officers or firefighters. Um, but we do know that even during the recovery process, there will be some missed work um, and missed um, family responsibilities. So we often, uh, you know, we say we don't want you to lift anything, uh, we don't want you to lift any heavy weights. And so for people who have toddlers, um, that can also be a concern because 
toddlers are heavy and they get carried around a lot. And so we sort of work with people to think about what that means um, for them. A lot of times people are saying, oh, well, I don't do any weightlifting or in my job I don't do heavy lifting. Um, but you may in your sort of family responsibilities because you're a gardener or because you're a parent. Um, and so we work with people to sort of figure out how our um, restrictions or advice can work in their own life. Um, we also ask for kidney donors that um, people, um, that women, um, avoid pregnancy for one year post donation. Um, we think that most pregnancies go well, but for young women or women of childbearing years, um, it's the riskiest thing you do, even though it's relatively not risky. And so we ask that people have a chance for full recovery and for their kidney to grow um, before they support a pregnancy. We also tell people that there's pain after surgery, um, and people may be on pain medication for up to a week. Some people don't need it when they leave the hospital, um, and some people require it for up to a week. After a week, we, when you come back on the visit, we'd want to make sure that everything's okay, but it's typically less than a week um, for pain medications, and we're moving away from having narcotics, and so people are often just on, on Tylenol, um, and that is often enough to do it for them, and we have multiple modalities that we use to control pain. Um, and there can be, um, it can be expensive um, in terms of lost wages. If you're donating to someone who's not um, in your immediate area, um, there's travel to the site, um, and perhaps the expense of um, having a care provider or having your support person come with you. Um, but we don't want costs to keep anyone from donating if that's something that they're interested in doing. And so all medical centers have um, social workers who can help people find resources, but we also encourage people to look within their families or communities to sort of ask for the supports that they would need, either material supports or have it coming in and helping with some things that they might otherwise pay for. And so when we think about the benefits, so the number one benefit um, that everyone thinks of is that you're helping someone who would need it. You're helping to prolong their life and to improve their quality of life. Um, but in terms of specific benefits, um, we know that the surgery and the workup is paid for by the recipient's insurance. And so all of those multiple tests and studies that people get to prove that you're healthy enough to donate, you won't have to pay for. Um, and so that, for many people, is a, and you don't have to argue with your insurance company and justify it, that's taken care of by the recipient's insurance. Um, and for the time off, um, you know, having a surgery, regardless of the cause, having an elective surgery is covered under medical leave. And so people can take time off through medical leave um, if they have that benefit through their jobs or um, through FMLA if they happen to be eligible. Um, we're working um, at the state level and, and nationally to have a special um, leave package specifically for donors. Um, in Illinois, Currently, it's just public employees of the state who have uh, 30 days off um, after any donation, um, bone marrow or solid organ, and there are no tax benefits. But that may vary by state, and so we encourage people to look and see um, what the benefits are within your state, and if they are um, equally sparse, you know, to consider lobbying for this, um, because not everyone, we don't want we want everyone who can and who wants to donate to be able to and not have finance as be a barrier to donation. And so when people think about donating, oftentimes the first step is, um, uh, well, the first step is sort of hearing about it and thinking about it. And I want to say that sometimes people are not sure if the person that they're asking is right for it or if they're healthy enough or if they want to do it. And I will say that the first step is just an ask and sending them to the transplant center um, because we will not take a kidney from someone who we don't think would do okay without that kidney. And so I think the first step is just talking about it within your family and within your community and sort of considering it as an, as an option um, and getting to the transplant center. But the first step when you appear at the transplant center, um, or even before that, is a blood test um, to see if the donor and recipient are blood type compatible. Um, and then the three tests are done to sort of further look at compatibility, um, blood type, cross match, and HLA testing. Um, and so I won't go into, uh, for many of the high school biology to talk about the blood types, but we know that um, based on blood type, there are people that you can and cannot donate to or receive an organ from. 
Um, and then tissue typing um, is uh, also, we look at six main factors and you know, people can be trans, people can be donors to people who don't have a tissue type match, but the more of a match there is, the better the long-term outcomes. Um, and we know that um, as we, through illness, through pregnancy, through blood transfusions, um, people who, intended people can mount a response to particles in other people's blood. And so what happens is the blood from the um, potential recipient and the donor are mixed, and if that person, if the potential recipient mounts a response to the donor's um, blood, then we call that cross-match positive in that, um, which is a bad thing, and that the donors, um, the recipient cells attack the donors, and so we think that that would not be a good, they wouldn't be a good donor. And if they're negative, then there's no reaction, and people, um, the pair is considered compatible. So there are three hurdles. Um, first, you have to be healthy. Um, you have to be, to, there are three hurdles to, direct, to donate directly to someone. Um, you have to be healthy, you have to be blood compatible, and you have to be a cross match positive. And then people can give both to a family member, but they can also give to someone that they're not related to by blood. That person tends to be a friend or a spouse, but we've had people donate within their um, religious communities, within their Facebook networks. Um, and you can also be unrelated to the person. We have people who are non-directed um, and they uh, donate to someone who sort of matches their blood type and um, cross-match. But then there are people who we love or care about and want to donate to and we only meet that first hurdle. So we're healthy, but we're either not blood compatible or not um, uh, cross-match, we're not cross-match negative. And so through, there are medical ways that we can get around that, but the other way um, that we do it is through um, an exchange. And so that's, if I wanted to give to my um, husband, um, but we didn't have the same blood type, I would give to someone else. got a kidney that was a good match for them, but it didn't come directly from the person that they knew. And so we can do a paired exchange, we can do three paired exchanges, you know, we can do um, as many, there, it's a computer algorithm, so people aren't sitting there trying to figure it out, um, but we do know that if donation is something that people are interested in, then other than being healthy, having the right blood type or have, being the right match shouldn't necessarily preclude them from get, giving a kidney on behalf of that person. Um, this is just a brief, maybe more than you wanted to know, but I just, you know, sometimes when we think of surgery, we sort of think of this big um, deal, and they're relatively small, three smaller things, um, and so people are not open um, up completely. They're actually three small incisions, um, and then there's air in the abdomen, um, and then an incision for the kidney to come out, um, and so this is called a laparoscopic procedure, um, and this actually reduces um, recovery time reduces scarring. Um, so people have a relatively short recovery time. We sort of talked about one or two days in the hospital um, and at least two weeks out of work um, and then less post-op pain. Uh, and so we want, you know, most, the vast majority of cases um, with kidney donation are this laparoscopic, sort of this minimally invasive procedure. And so what are some of the longer term outcomes for the donor? Um, so we know that donation is short in the, safe in the short term. So the risks of going on to die, which is the, the most serious complication, is about three in 10,000. So very low, but still present. Um, and then major complications is from 0.2 to um, 1%. But one of the things that we wanna highlight um, is that there are risks long term in having one kidney. And so the risk of going on to develop in stage kidney disease is about five to 10 times higher in living donors. Um, and the risk of having pregnancy related complications such as preeclampsia or high blood pressure in pregnancy um, are about two times compared to non donors. However, um, even though those rates are higher, those rates are still relatively low. So the risk for in stage renal disease for someone who donates. Um, 
tend to be still less than 1% over 15 years. So higher than it would be otherwise, but still relatively safe. And I can say, you know, we compete with a lot of medical centers, but I can say that at any medical center that evaluates a living donor, if their risk of going on to develop end-stage renal disease is too high, then they will be declined. We don't want to hurt, we don't want to hurt one person to benefit another. And so um, part of that low risk is because medical centers actually choose um, who should be able to donate based on their prediction um, of a good outcome. Um, we see that preeclampsia and gestational uh, high blood pressure are about um, 5%. So this is something we use for a living uh, donor calculator. I won't go into it, um, but just to say that who your risk is based on um, who you are, typically racial background, and then other, your age, uh, gender, uh, your pre-existing kidney function, blood pressure, um, and then BMI. So um, as people come and talk to you, um, the medical provider, um, rather than sort of having the general list, um, people can hear how the risk of kidney disease applies to them specifically and sort of make a more personal decision. All right, so we know for us and hopefully for, for all of you, the primary goal is to prevent end-stage renal disease um, through maintaining a healthy weight, um, avoiding uh, diabetes, avoiding high blood pressure, and if uh, we have those diseases, getting those under control so that we don't develop kidney disease. Um, but living donation is a wonderful thing to consider. Um, but we want people to understand both the risks and the benefits and the costs um, and to make the best decision for themselves and, and for their family. Um, but also, if you think you're never going to be um, a living donor, to at least um, inform or support someone who may make that decision. Um, and then the final note, I said it multiple times, but if you remember nothing about what the kidney does, um, we just want people to remember that transplant uh, staff that people encounter um, don't just want to take your kidney. We actually want to help people um, make an informed decision based on who they are individually and their personal goals and, and health status, um, make a decision that works best for, for them. All right. And then... Any questions? Okay. Great. So I can I can give the mic to whoever has a question. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? Okay. Right there. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you need names, but David McCurdy from Elmhurst College. Okay. Um, I wanted to be sure I understood about the insurance part again. Yeah. Uh, the donor's insurance pays for some things, I understand that. I guess the question is, are there some medical expenses that would still fall to the, uh, I'm sorry, the recipient's insurance yeah. pays, but are there still some expenses that will fall to the donor that may or may not be covered by their insurance? Sure, so that's a great question. Um, so yes, we require um, people to have their age-appropriate cancer screen. Um, so if you are over 50 and have had, not had a colonoscopy, um, we want people to have a colonoscopy. And so typically the um, potential recipient's insurance would not pay for that because that is something that is recommended for your own health. Um, so things like that. If you um, have, uh, we talked about, uh, you know, if a center, if you have high blood pressure, and we need your blood pressure to be controlled in order for you to be considered a donor, the recipient's insurance would not pay for the blood pressure medication because that's sort of part of your ongoing care. So things that are ongoing um, would be paid for, but everything, including the medications that you have, um, you know, the pain medications that you have upon discharge are paid for by the recipient's insurance. And a lot of, some of the diagnostic work up too. If we think, you know, if you are over 50 and you need a EKG, that's part of the donor workup, that's paid for by the recipient's insurance. And then the, the visits to the medical center are also paid for um, up to two years after. Yes. Um, my question, oh, sorry. Um, my question is that if somebody is already a, had a transplant and would like to be a donor, can they be a donor? If they've had a transplant? Yeah, if they have any kind of trans transplants, can they become a donor? 
Yes. So we have had, so, yes. So th the short answer is yes. Um, we would want to make sure, depending on the type of transplant, how recent that was and where the transplant was. Um, you know, if they had had another abdominal uh, transplant, there could potentially be some scarring. So we would certainly look at them closely, but having a prior transplant um, doesn't um, exclude, preclude someone from being a living uh, kidney donor. Thank you. Um, in the case of uh, chain donation, are there opportunities for the people who, for the donor and the recipient who are strangers to have relationships and get to know each other? And in general, what's the centers, your centers, or perhaps more generally in the United States, attitude towards relationships created between donors and recipients? Is that something that they feel like they have to control? I mean, there's People have complained about the so-called Frankenstein syndrome when people feel like something that doesn't belong to them is inside their body, they want to get rid of it, and so some centers are inclined towards reducing relationships, right? Yeah, um, so one thing I think people want to reduce, um, manage the relationship before donation, right? Because up until the point where um, you donate, we want people to feel free of um, coercion and feel like they can back out. And so that certainly is true of non-directed donors. After donation, um, different medical centers have policies about how long before they would um, release the information to the recipient so that they can choose whether or not they would like to contact the donor. And so we manage the relationship to the extent that we want to wait a, a, an amount of time, and we want the donor and recipient to be recovered and sort of out of the first, uh, out of the heat of the moment, um, and then we can release that information. And so if someone donates and is never contacted, it's because the, um, the recipient has chosen not to. Mm -hmm. 